Hey everybody, this is Ted Januszewski, and this video is an answer to an email I got from Vlad in Whippinger, New York, and Vlad writes, Dear Ted, top five patristic exegetes, go. Brassy. I like it. All right. Um, number five. Dang it. So it turns out I actually can't make this video. I just can't pick. Every time I sit down to start filming, I have a different number one. It's impossible. Ah. So anyway, we're gonna change course here. I'm going to count down my top five patristic exegetes in reverse chronological order, making no judgments about who's better, just latest to earliest. It's the only way this is gonna happen. But before we get to that list, I wanna lay out a short introduction to the Church Fathers, just to set the stage, with a few honorable mentions mixed in that didn't quite make the cut. So if you're already an expert on patristic exegesis and just want to see my top five list, the next video will be out soon. If you're not an expert, in fact, if you're brand new to this and have no idea what I'm talking about, let me just lay it out for you real quick. What I mean when I say patristic exegete is a church father who spent time interpreting the scriptures. Now, basically every church father deals with the Bible in his writings, in theological treatises, polemics, letters, homilies. But a select few of them set their hand to writing in-depth Bible commentaries to open up the scriptures to the people of God. Those men, the church fathers who wrote commentaries on the Bible, are the subject of this video. So let's turn now to our first honorable mention, St. Hesychius of Jerusalem. Ah, St. Hesychius. Good old St. Hesychius. Actually, we uh, know hardly anything about St. Hesychius. What we do know is that he flourished in the early mid fifth century, was a presbyter of the Church of Jerusalem, and that his feast day is March 28th. And according to the Menologion, he commented on the entire Bible. Whether or not that's true, there's actually a pretty good amount of exegesis that's come down to us under his name. Let me just give you a little key to this. If a work is in green, it's come down to us in its entirety or with only minor gaps. If it's yellow, it's only partially complete, but there's a pretty good chunk there. If it's red, we have only a tiny fragment, maybe even like a sentence. Also, there are four different categories of patristic works we'll mainly be considering in this video. COM stands for commentary, a thorough line-by-line -line exegesis of the entire book. SCAL stands for scalia, these are brief notes, often written in the margin of a Bible manuscript, kind of like the notes in a study Bible. HOM stands for homilies. A lot of the church fathers practiced what's called expository preaching, where you preach through some book of the Bible in a series of homilies, so that when you finished, you had basically a spoken word commentary on that book of the Bible. Finally, QUIST stands for quaestiones, meaning questions. These works go through a book of the Bible asking and answering a series of questions one might have on reading through it. Basically, it's a series of little essays on the problem verses of that book. As you can see, Hesychius wrote works in all four categories. His commentaries on Leviticus and the Psalter are both massive, hundreds of pages each. Unfortunately, none of his works, to my knowledge, has ever been translated into English. Hesychius, in his exegesis, was solidly of the Alexandrian school. And he had kind of a funny way of writing. He'll stop, sometimes in the middle of a verse, sometimes after only one word, and sort of interrogate the text. What does this mean? Why does it say this? It's kind of an interesting style, and one that you see even in his homilies. Now, what do I mean when I say Hesychius was solidly of the Alexandrian school. What's that all about? Let's turn aside to Excursus 1, 
the patristic schools. There were, by my reckoning, four main schools of patristic exegesis. To clarify, these aren't schools like a college with buildings and a faculty, more like a school of thought. Also, let me say at the outset, this is my analysis. You're not going to find this in a book, at, at least not in this precise form, but I think it'll help you get the lay of the land. Starting from the East, the Syriac exegetical tradition is just fascinating, with a number of intriguing similarities to rabbinic exegesis, especially in the early years. This is the school that produced the Peshitta, a translation of the Bible into Syriac, on which see my video, Top 5 Bible Translations of All Time. The great luminary of the Syriac Church is St. Ephraim, who was made a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict XV in 1920. But there are also a number of other figures who really ought to be better known to us here in the West. As time passed, Syriac exegesis came to be influenced more and more by the methods of the school of Antioch, one of the two Greek schools of patristic exegesis, the other, of course, being Alexandria. Now, these you will read about in books. The schools of Antioch and Alexandria had enormous influence, and their literary output was enough to fill entire bookshelves even only counting what's come down to us, which is just a fraction of what they produced. The school of Antioch was, obviously, centered around the city of Antioch on the Orontes River in the Roman province of Syria, which is why it later came to be so influential in the nearby Syriac-speaking church. Antiochian exegesis focuses on the letter of scripture, the literal sense. Its methods were mainly historical and grammatical, Antiochians focus on the text, on what the text actually says, and they study it in minute detail, with textual criticism to decide between variants, grammatical analysis to clarify meaning, literary criticism to take into account matters of genre, and history to understand the context, who wrote this and why. The School of Alexandria, on the other hand, based, of course, in Alexandria, the great metropolis of Egypt, focused on the spiritual sense. Its method of choice was allegory. Not that they ignored the letter, but they considered it essentially a departure point for deeper, more spiritual reflection. Alexandrian exegesis is not so much interested in grammar or syntax or the brute facts of history. It wants to know what the scriptures have to teach us about the nature of God and his will for us. They read the Bible to learn how Christians ought to act in this world and about our eternal destination in heaven. So what gave rise to these two approaches? One way of looking at it is as a distinction between Plato and Aristotle. The Alexandrians had a tone of mysticism and contemplation that was resonant with much of contemporary Platonism, like for instance, Philo of Alexandria which is why the Alexandrian fathers gravitated toward speculative theology. The Antiochians, on the other hand, were more resonant with Aristotle, with their tone of rigorous scientific inquiry. Another way of looking at it is as a distinction between the Stoics and the Sophists. When the Stoics read the Greek classics like Homer and Hesiod, they employed an allegorical method to draw lessons from the text because their goal was to do philosophy, to talk about ethics and the shape of the universe. So they found a way of reading the classics that got them where they wanted to go. Now, Alexandrian Christian allegory was by no means identical with Stoic allegory. One difference, obviously, was that the Alexandrians applied the method to scripture, not Greek mythology. For another, they believed very strongly that the events in scripture actually happened and were not myths. But despite the differences, there's no doubt that there was influence on Alexandrian allegory from the Stoics. On the other side, when the Sophists read the classics, it was to learn from them the elements of good Greek style. Let me just clarify here. In antiquity, Sophist meant a teacher of rhetoric, not a fake intellectual like the word has come to mean today. So a Sophist, or rhetoric teacher, would take on students and teach them from the classics how to speak well how to build an argument, how to interpret a law, how to construct a narrative out of fragmentary evidence. 
These are the methods Antiochian exegetes applied to the scriptures, which explains why they were such keen readers of the text and why their judgment still carries weight today. Their trade, their entire life was the Greek language. And these guys were good. They knew Greek like nobody before or since. When an Antiochian says the Greek means this, you sit up and take notice. The tension between these two approaches to scripture shapes the history of Christian antiquity and, I would argue, continues to affect the church down to this day. All right, you know what, before we move on to the last school, a qualification. These differences between Antioch and Alexandria are not categorical. The Alexandrians did study grammar and history and did care about the text. And the Antiochians did do theology. And although they explicitly rejected the allegorical method, they used a similar method called typology to tether the Old Testament to the New and find Christ where he is foretold in Moses and the prophets. As a rule, the best and most mature members of each school knew and made use of the methods of their competitors. The difference was mainly one of emphasis. What lies at the heart of biblical exegesis, the letter or the spirit? The school of Antioch technically began with Lucian the Martyr, who died in 312, although none of his writings have survived. Diodor of Tarsus is considered by many the second founder of the school, and his influence can be seen in all the great Antiochian commentators that followed. The school of Alexandria started much earlier. The founding figure, Pantanus, flourished in the mid to late second century, and like Lucian, none of his writings have come down to us. And the Alexandrian school had sort of a second founder as well, uh, namely Origen, who, like Diodor in Antioch, set the agenda for all subsequent Alexandrian exegesis. Now, no, no, wait a minute. Jerome? Yes. Although Jerome wrote in Latin, he is definitely in the Greek exegetical tradition. He spoke Greek fluently, and he read pretty much every Greek Bible commentary that had been written up to his day. He had a special affinity with Origen, which later became a source of embarrassment to him. And he actually studied with Didymus the Blind, whom he held in the highest esteem. As a matter of fact, it was a pretty common thing for men of learning in the Western church to know Greek. For instance, St. Hilary and St. Ambrose both knew Greek and were, by the way, very definitely in the Alexandrian tradition. The great notable exception to the rule that educated Romans knew Greek was St. Augustine, who was to become the fountainhead of the fourth exegetical school, the Latin. I mean, Augustine probably knew Greek better than most classics majors do today. But unlike his contemporaries, he never quite achieved fluency. Augustine spoke and thought and read the scriptures in Latin. And so he only knew the Greek exegetical tradition secondhand through teachers like St. Ambrose. Luckily, Augustine was a genius of such epic proportions, of such architectonic originality and brilliance that he was able basically to found a new school so that all subsequent Western biblical thought follows his lead. Augustine was influenced by his training in Roman rhetoric and law, by his readings in Neoplatonic philosophy, and by a number of earlier Latin writers, none of whom really quite fit into either of the Greek schools. But although we can identify influences, the Latin school really springs from the mind of this one man and bears the stamp of his personality. So those, by my reckoning, are the four schools of patristic exegesis. Let us now turn to honorable mention two, Diodor of Tarsus. Diodor didn't found the Antiochian school, but he was its seminal figure. His life and writings established the pattern of what it meant to be an exegete in the tradition of Antioch. Diodor was born in Antioch, got a good education over in Athens. Actually, he was a school buddy of St. Basil the Great and was eventually appointed bishop in the city of Tarsus. Diodor commented on most of the books of the Bible, but unfortunately, he came to be associated with the heresy of Nestorius, 
who was another Antiochian. And so we have from Diodor, note that he is not Saint Diodor, we have only one commentary that has come down to us complete because it was copied under someone else's name. Excursus II. Where do you find these texts? Now, at this point, if you're anything like me, you're wondering, where do I go to find these commentaries? Well, the Father's writings come down to us in manuscripts, which had to be copied and recopied by hand from the time they were written down to the invention of the printing press. But the problem with manuscripts is, almost every time a text gets copied, the scribe makes mistakes. St. Jerome famously complained about the copyists of his day, saying, in effect, people are going to think I'm an idiot because you guys keep copying my stuff wrong. Ah. That's a paraphrase. So, to establish an accurate text, editors try to look at as many manuscripts as they can. None of them is going to be perfect, but hopefully their mistakes will be in different places. The goal is to reconstruct as close as we can get to what the author actually wrote. This composite text, put together from multiple different manuscripts, is called a critical edition. Sometimes you'll find a critical edition of an ancient text published as a standalone work, but usually they're printed as part of a series. Here are some of the more important ones. These series are all pretty rigorous and scientific. Each volume has a learned introduction, usually in German, French, or Latin. And each will print what's called a critical apparatus, down here at the bottom of the page. Basically, it's how the editor shows his work. He reports what different readings he found in all the different manuscripts, so you can figure out why he chose the text he did. But the single greatest series of patristic writings ever collected was published in the mid-19th century by Jacques Paul Migne, who was just a diocesan priest, but what a dynamo. He founded what would go on to become the single largest privately held publishing house in France, which was really more a factory than a publishing house. It was full of steam-powered presses. This is the mid-19th century. This is before that was a thing. Everything was absolutely cutting edge, state of the art. It's like something out of a steampunk fantasy. At the height of production, they could turn out 2,000 volumes a day. Out of this publishing house emerged two collections of patristic writings, Patrologia Latina for the Latin Fathers and Patrologia Graeca for the Greeks. Each volume was enormous, covering multiple works, sometimes multiple authors, thousands of columns of text. I'm here in the stacks of the University of Rochester's main library. And back in the 80s, when St. Bernard Seminary shut down its main campus, the U of R picked up a complete set of mean. And if you lined all these books up on a football field, they would reach almost the 19-yard line. Minya's goal was to print the complete works of every single Christian writer from the close of the New Testament down to the Middle Ages. And in this, I would say, he was an overwhelming success. So in these volumes, the introductions and footnotes are all in Latin. And then the text on the page will be in either Latin or Greek, depending on what the father wrote in. But this is interesting. In Patrologia Graeca, on each page, there's a column of Greek. And then in the column next to it is a translation of the Greek into Latin so that the uneducated can follow along. And I'm not just insulting Latinists here. Remember that in the 19th century, every single Catholic priest spoke Latin. They prayed in Latin. They said mass in Latin. They went to seminary. All the classes, all the lectures were in Latin. All the textbooks were in Latin, which made it really convenient because you could print one textbook and send it to any seminary in the world. Latin really was the universal language of the church. And this was the case into the 20th century. I've got a dear friend who's a 90-year-old uh, uh, priest who remembers going to seminary in Latin. I actually suspect he still thinks in Latin and only translates it into English for the benefit of us plebs. So back in the day, they would only teach Greek to the best and the brightest, those who might stick around in the academy and teach classics, patristics, biblical studies, that sort of thing. 
So if you've ever been reading like Henri de Lubac and you turn to one of those pages that's like two thirds footnote and lifted up your hands to the heavens and asked, how was he able to read all the fathers? How? The answer is menia. Because with these series, anyone who has Latin, which in the 19th century meant every Catholic priest and most educated layman, everyone who has Latin can read basically all the fathers of the church. What an amazing resource. So how did one French priest manage to accomplish all this in the course of a few short decades? By shamelessly copying older works. To keep up the pace of production, Minya put as little original effort into these editions as possible. For instance, I was just looking at his volume on St. Isidore of Pelusium. Minya's text is reprinted from an edition published in 1638, which itself reprinted editions dating back as far as 1585. So, although Minya's edition dates from the 19th century, the scholarship is much older. Meaning basically that what you've got in Minya is usually not the greatest text of a particular church father. If you can find it in one of those other later series, use that one instead. It's going to be better. But for a lot of the fathers, Minya is the only text we've got, and his patrologies are a monument to what one man with a vision can accomplish. All right, enough on that. Let's keep her moving. Honorable mention three, Theodore of Mopsuestia. Theodore was born in Antioch and actually was a school buddy of St. John Chrysostom. They both studied rhetoric with the pagan orator Libanius and then both embraced the monastic life and studied scripture with Diodore of Tarsus. At a certain point, Theodore decided against a career in the church and was fixing to get married and become a lawyer. But Chrysostom sent him a couple of really delightful letters, which you can still read today, entitled To Theodore the Lapsed. And he convinced him, with the result that Theodore spent the rest of his life in service to the church, first as a priest, then as bishop of the city of Mopsuestia, which is about 40 miles east of Tarsus. Theodore was a powerful preacher and a polemicist and was constantly striking down heresy and building up the Catholic faith. He also wrote Bible commentaries, and boy, could this guy write. Theodore was of the Antiochian school and was in many ways its archetypal representative. You find in Theodore all the historical grammatical rigor one would expect from an Antiochian and all the suspicion of allegory too. On this last point, Theodore was something of a purist. He would only accept something in the Old Testament as messianic prophecy when he was absolutely forced to. For instance, Theodore believed only four of the Psalms, 2, 8, 45, and 110, referred directly to Christ. I don't know, whatever makes you happy. Anyway, Theodore died in the bosom of the church, old and full of years, and was venerated near and far for his holiness and great learning. Unfortunately, like Diodore, his teacher, Theodore came to be associated with Nestorius. And so Theodore and his writings were condemned, and we have only a fraction of what he wrote. Now, Theodore's single most important work, and the only one that could settle once and for all whether he was a Nestorian or an Orthodox Christian, was his 15-book treatise on the Incarnation of the Lord. And amazingly, a complete copy of the treatise in Syriac was discovered in 1905 before being burned 10 years later in the Armenian Genocide. So we'll probably never know exactly what Theodore believed about the Incarnation. Honestly, Theodore deserves to be in the top five, but we have so little of his work left over that I just had to give his spot to. We've got the beginning of his Genesis commentary, which is very interesting what he has to say about those first three chapters. We have about half of his commentary on the Psalms. His commentary on the minor Pauline epistles has come down to us complete in Latin translation, 
Actually, his only commentary to survive in the Greek is this one on the Minor Prophets. I should mention in closing that in the Church of the East, Theodore is venerated as a saint under the title Theodore the Interpreter. It has a certain ring to it, don't you think? Anyhow, so much for Theodore. Excursus 3, where do you find these texts in English? Oh, was, was that what you wanted to know earlier? Okay, we can talk about that. Honestly, if you hear about a commentary by a church father and would like to see if it's been done in English, the first thing I would do is Google it. For instance, I only just discovered that St. Ambrose's commentary on the Gospel of Luke was finally translated by an Orthodox woman named Theodosia Tompkinson. The translation wasn't marketed in any of the major catalogs, and I've never seen it in a bibliography. The only way you'd ever find this book is if you went looking for it. And there are a lot of translations like that floating around. Some self-published, some done as part of a doctoral dissertation, some posted by private scholars to their web pages. For instance, my friend Roger Pierce has spent years commissioning translations of untranslated patristic works, and now has one of the largest collections of the fathers in English freely available on his website, which I'll link to in the show notes down below. There have been, over the years, a number of translation series. And although there are still large gaps, the majority of patristic writings are now available in English. The first of these endeavors was launched by St. John Henry Newman and his friends in the Oxford movement. They were high church Anglicans, so their goal in translating was, very simply, to show how Catholic the church fathers are. This was soon answered by a rival translation series by a bunch of Presbyterian pastors up in Scotland who furnished their translations with abundant notes on how actually the Church Fathers are 100% not Catholic. The Scottish tried to sell these translations overseas in the American market, but at such a huge markup that the Episcopal Bishop of Western New York, A. Cleveland Cox, brazenly pirated the work reprinting it in his series, Antonicene Fathers. You can actually see Bishop Cox's portrait hanging up in the Episcopal home here in Rochester, which he founded in 1868. The Americans and the Scots eventually came to an understanding and together published this enormous series, Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, which drew both from the Oxford Movement's Library of the Fathers and a series of translations of St. Augustine edited by Marcus Dodds. The next great series of patristic translations were launched in the 20th century. And here I'm talking about two American series that have come now to dominate the field, Ancient Christian Writers and Fathers of the Church. Ancient Christian Writers came out first, and they were none too pleased when Fathers of the Church launched the very next year as evidenced by their scathing review of the first volume of the rival series. But I think they've buried the hatchet now. As you can see, the Fathers of the Church here is now nearly twice as long as ancient Christian writers. But in most cases, ancient Christian writers has better notes and introductions. The two series actually complement each other pretty well. A couple more recent series are also worth mentioning. In 1990, New City Press began translating, for the first time, the complete works of St. Augustine into English. As of this video, they've completed 42 of a projected 49 volumes. When this is finished, it will be a monument to Augustine scholarship in our generation. Second, I want to mention InterVarsity Press's series, Ancient Christian Texts, which is actually focused specifically on translating patristic exegesis. It's only a decade old and already has 16 volumes, so hopefully bright times ahead. The problem with most of these series is that there's a tendency to overlap. Each series wants to cover the great classics. Few want to go through the trouble of translating works that are sort of on the margins. So the Confessions of St. Augustine has been translated into English something like a dozen separate times. Meanwhile, there are works out there, major works, that haven't been translated even once. Until very recently, most of the Church Fathers' Bible commentaries fell into that category. 
but that's now changed, thanks largely to the efforts of two men, two benefactors of mankind who have done more to open up the scriptures to the church than the entire edifice of Catholic biblical scholarship. The first is Robert C. Hill, a biblical scholar at Australian Catholic University who translated 32 volumes of patristic commentary before his untimely death in 2007. Just look at that list. The second great translator of our times is actually a friend of mine, Thomas P. Scheck of Ave Maria University, who's translated 11 volumes of the Fathers and is still going strong, with two more coming out this next year and a third now in progress. These are the faces of the men who have opened the vault of our exegetical tradition and brought out its treasures for anyone who wants to read them. On behalf of all of us, thank you for everything you have done for the church. And if you have Greek, Latin, or Syriac and would like to put your skills to good use, there are many more commentaries still remaining to be translated. Feel free to send me an email and I'll happily recommend a couple you might start working on. Honorable mention for Didymus the Blind. Didymus is one of the more interesting figures in church history. He was, in fact, blind after an illness when he was just four years old. But that didn't stop him from becoming one of the great exegetes of the early church. Didymus spent his entire life in Alexandria and deeply imbibed the Alexandrian style of exegesis. And he had the most amazing memory. You can tell reading his commentaries, he had practically the entire Bible memorized, as well as knowing minute details of grammar, rhetoric, and history. Didymus rose to the heights of fame, and people came from all over the Roman world to hear him teach. His most famous disciple was Saint Jerome, who is almost embarrassingly effusive in praising his teacher, his holiness, his wisdom, and the humble austerity of his life. Didymus died at a ripe old age and left behind him a mountain of learned tomes, all written by dictation, of course, including treatises against the heresies of the day and Bible commentaries. Unfortunately, Didymus's name got caught up in the originist controversy of the sixth century with the result that his writings were condemned. We actually would know very little of Didymus's teaching if it weren't for a spectacular manuscript find at Tura in Egypt in 1941, where about 2,000 pages of Didymus's writings were rediscovered, including large parts of five of his Bible commentaries. Although really, two of them were not so much Bible commentaries as lecture notes taken by one of his students. And it's really interesting to see the back and forth in the classroom. It's a pretty advanced group. Think like a PhD seminar, except the students are really smart and do a really good job of keeping old Didymus on his toes. There's a story that St. Anthony the Great, the father of Christian monasticism, on one of his few trips to Alexandria, made a point of visiting Didymus and said to him, it is not a hard thing, nor does it deserve to be grieved over, O Didymus, that you are deprived of the organs of sight, which are possessed also by rats, mice, and the lowest of animals. But it is a great blessing to possess eyes like the angels, whereby you contemplate keenly the divine being and see true knowledge with accuracy. As with Theodore of Mopsuestia, if we had more of Didymus's writings, he definitely would have made the top five. And let me just say that I, for one, think it is a crying shame that Didymus the Blind, undoubtedly one of the holiest men ever to draw breath on this earth, is not venerated as a saint in the Catholic Church. But we can still learn from him. We've been talking for a while now about the topic of patristic exegesis. I want to pause here and address the question, why this topic? Why are the fathers and their Bible commentaries so important? Isn't their stuff outdated? And in any event, 
it's just their opinion, right? Now, a lot of people don't know this, but one of the categories of infallible teaching in the Catholic Church is what's called the consensus patrum, the consensus of the fathers. And the rule is, and here I'm quoting from the councils of Trent and Vatican I, the rule is that as a Catholic, you cannot interpret scripture contrary to the unanimous consensus of the fathers. Pope Leo XIII explains why in his encyclical Providentissimus Deus. The Holy Fathers, we say, are of supreme authority whenever they all interpret in one and the same manner any text of the Bible as pertaining to the doctrine of faith or morals. For their unanimity clearly shows that such interpretation has come down from the apostles as a matter of Catholic faith. So, the reason Catholics have such a high view of patristic exegesis is that when the fathers all agree on a certain interpretation of the scriptures, we hear in their unanimity an authentic and reliable echo of the teaching of the apostles. Let me back this up with some Newman. St. John Henry Cardinal Newman has this to say about doctrines taught by the consensus of the fathers. We receive those doctrines which they thus teach, not merely because they teach them, but because they bear witness that all Christians everywhere then held them. We take them as honest informants, but not as a sufficient authority in themselves, though they are an authority too. If they were to state these very same doctrines, but say, these are our opinions, we deduce them from scripture, and they are true. We might well doubt about receiving them at their hands. We might fairly say that we had as much right to deduce from scripture as they had, that deductions of scripture were mere opinions, that if our deductions agreed with theirs, that would be a happy coincidence and increase our confidence in them, but if they did not, it could not be helped. We must follow our own light. Doubtless, no man has any right to impose his own deductions upon another in matters of faith. But this is not the state of the case as regards the primitive fathers. They do not speak of their own private opinion. They do not say, this is true because we see it in scripture, about which there might be differences of judgment. But this is true because in matter of fact, it is held and has ever been held by all the churches, down to our times without interruption ever since the apostles. Where the question is merely one of testimony, namely whether they had the means of knowing that it had been and was so held. For if it was the belief of so many and independent churches at once, and that on the ground of its being from the apostles, doubtless it cannot but be true and apostolic. Amazing. Nobody says it like Newman. What's an example of this, you might ask? Here's an example. I noticed a few years back when I was preparing a class on the church fathers, an interesting pattern in their citations of Malachi chapter 1, verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. And in every place, incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. This will be familiar to any Catholics out there from Eucharistic Prayer 3 of the Ordinary Form Mass. So that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. But this verse is never quoted in the New Testament. At best, there are some allusions, although that's arguable. However, if you look back at the early fathers, you will find full citations of this verse in St. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus, and Tertullian, all applying it to Christian worship. So what you have is three testimonies on three different continents in two different languages within the first two centuries of the founding of the church, all saying, hey, you know that prophecy in Malachi 1.11? Yeah, we're the fulfillment of that. Because we gather in worship, we offer sacrifice, and our sacrifice, our pure offering, is the Holy Eucharist. 
So where did the fathers all get this teaching? Think back to Acts chapter 20. So Paul is in Troas, remember? And he's teaching them late into the night until uh, around midnight, uh, Eutychus falls out the window and dies. Poor Eutychus. And then Paul raises him back to life and then keeps on teaching until daybreak, at which point he and his disciples hit the road. Because we all know there's nothing like an all-nighter to prepare you for a hike. But I've often wondered, what did Paul preach on for all that time? He wasn't just reading his letters over and over again. What was he preaching on? In my opinion, there's only one answer. He was preaching on the Old Testament. Same with his 18 months at Corinth and parts of three years at Ephesus. I think reading the Old Testament in the light of Christ was the core of Paul's teaching. And we get glimpses of this in his letters, often in shorthand, because Paul didn't need to teach them in his letters, just remind them of what he'd already explained at length in person. Unfortunately for us, we weren't there at Troas. We don't have direct access to Paul's preaching, but that doesn't mean we have no access because Paul's words fell on good soil and sprouted and bore fruit, and that fruit would go on to abide in the church in the form of faithful biblical teaching. And so when we read the writings of the early fathers and see them all agreeing on something like Malachi 1.11, we can rely on that teaching as going back to the initial deposit. That is how we have access to the apostolic preaching. So the long and short of it is, when the fathers all agree, we have in their consensus a facet of the capital T tradition. But what about when the fathers don't agree? Which is actually most of the time. Back to Pope Leo and Providentissimus Deus. The opinion of the fathers is also of very great weight. So not supreme authority, but very great weight when they treat of these matters, that is faith and morals, in their capacity of doctors, unofficially. Not only because they excel in their knowledge of revealed doctrine and in their acquaintance with many things which are useful in understanding the apostolic books, but because they are men of eminent sanctity and of ardent zeal for the truth, on whom God has bestowed a more ample measure of his light. Wherefore, the expositor should make it his duty to follow their footsteps with all reverence and to use their labors with intelligent appreciation. Such a good encyclical. The point Pope Leo is making here is that what's going to lead you to deep understanding of the scriptures is not a PhD in biblical philology. It is sanctity and an ardent zeal for the truth, which is not to say that you should neglect your studies, but study alone will not lead to understanding. Friends, the Bible is God's book. He will disclose its secrets only to those who tremble at his word. And the fathers of the church are our teachers and guides to exploring the mind of God in scripture. These men are the first and best teachers of the universal church. And their writings have been handed down through the generations with great labor and sacrifice for you. There is no reason their writings should be the sole preserve of experts. No reason these books should languish in obscurity, gathering dust in academic libraries while the people of God starve for sound instruction. The fathers belong in your house and on your bookshelf. What we're doing in this video is not an exercise in antiquarianism. This is not a history lesson on how folks used to read the Bible. I am convinced that we, the church of the 21st century, need to learn what the fathers knew and we forgot. How to read the Bible as the word of God.